Well, yesterday at 11 a.m., we had our, uh, the burial service for Dr. James Hamp Hampton. Some of you may have known Dr. Hamp Hampton. Some of you may not. He actually went to the Saturday service at 5 o'clock, and he sat about in the middle on this side of the sanctuary. Uh, and Dr. Hampton uh, was just a great guy, great sense of humor, always smiling, a doctor for a number of years. Uh, and one of the things we reflected on during our time together remembering the gift of his life was that he had an incredible care for people. Um, he cared, of course, about his family, uh, had some great friends, and also he cared about his patients as well. Very competent, uh, sought to do the best he could by everybody that he served. And as I talked with his daughter-in-law, Tracy, in preparation for the service, uh, there were some interesting things we reflected on. One of the realities that she shared with me is that uh, uh, her father-in-law, Dr. Hampton, was actually a creaster. And I said to her, I said, what's a creaster? I've never heard that word before. And she goes, oh, that's somebody who only comes to church Christmas and Easter. <laughs> and I said to her, where have you been all my life? I've been a priest for 30, 35 years. That is a term I could have used in relationship to a lot of people. I know a lot of creasters, and you're going to be hearing it from time to time from here on out. I just thought that was a great one-word capture. Um, and so he would go to church through most of his life, Christmas and Easter. And then he would come to church a little bit more when his family would come down. They would take him to church more often. But over the past few years, he began to come to St. John's at the Saturday 5 o'clock service on a more consistent basis. And during that time in his life, he uh, just became more open to the Lord. And he came into a personal relationship with Christ. Uh, he had the experience that the Lord really loved him and cared about him. Many times he would be in tears. Uh, and, of course, most of the time for Dr. Hampton, for James, he'd be laughing. Uh, when he had that smile on his face, it was a combination of, of sincere joy but also you were wondering if you were gonna be part of the joke he was gonna be telling in a few moments or not. Uh, that's just the way he was. But you know, one of the wonderful things about the worship here uh, at the Saturday service as well was that he came to know the Lord from being in this place. Uh, the warmth of the people, the love, the welcome, and the Holy Spirit's presence. And uh, Tracy shared this with tears coming down her face because the family had been praying for him for a number of years and it wanted this so much to happen for him, and it, and it finally did. During most of his life early on, he talked about, you know, when he died, he was looking forward to seeing his wife again, which I always thought was a wonderful thing for uh, someone to say. But most recently, over the past two or three years, what he would often share with his family is that when he passed on, he was looking forward to seeing Jesus. How awesome is that? How powerful is that? And so, you know, we affirm the reality that when uh, James passed on and went through the gates, um, his wife was there to greet him. Family and friends were there to greet him. People he didn't expect would be there were there to greet him. <laughs> and most importantly, the Lord was there to greet him. And so, you know, it's interesting as we gather here, and some of you have been coming here for years to worship the Lord. Um, the reality is that worship is a very powerful thing. And as we look at the scriptures, and I think as we experience life, one of the important things that you and I need to affirm is that part of the reason that we were created was to worship the living God. That's a very fundamental part of our nature. And I would submit to you that every human being worships someone or something. It's going to happen. Just like all of us breathe air, all of us eat, all of us drink, it's a fundamental aspect of being a human being. And a funda fundamental aspect of our spirituality, and every human being has a spirituality because that's a part of who we are, is that we will worship someone or something. And ideally, our created intent intent was to worship the living God. And so as you look at the gospel lesson with me today, Jesus is teaching us about worship, and he's opening up a window about what worship is really about. And he shares 
But the hour is coming and is now here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father is seeking such people to worship him. You know, it's interesting to me, there there are a couple of things in my life that constantly amaze me. God's love for me and for humanity in the midst of the reality of who we are. You know, it speaks to me about the reality that God is love, and I'm so grateful for that. The other thing that always amazes me is that, is this particular verse. It says in here that God is seeking people to worship him. It's almost like those uh, guys along the road in Naples that are spinning those signs about the special deals. Or, I mean, what a real gift that is. I, that sign would be like in the wall somewhere if I was doing that. You wouldn't want to be around me if I was spinning that sign. You'd be in trouble. You know, and, and about the special deals and, and needs for people being hired. It's like the Lord has a help wanted sign. Looking for worshipers. <laughs> That's what it says. God desires people to worship him. God wants that. God wants to have that kind of relationship with you and me. He wants to have a relationship with you that is rooted in worship. But specifically those worshipers that would worship him in spirit and in truth. And so what what does that look like? Um, Well, one of the places I love to go online is Bible Hub. And in their commentary, they share the following. In spirit is the highest, deepest, noblest part of our humanity, the point of contact between God and man. It is distinct from sensual limitations like place or form. And what that basically is saying is that God is spirit. God is spirit. And so for us to worship God, there needs to be a spiritual connection. Now, for you and me, that can be difficult because we're very much what we can touch, what we can see, what we can feel, what we can eat. We're very much concrete in terms of as as being human beings, and that's very normal. But there is this spiritual dimension for us that needs to be cultivated. It's kind of like feeling the wind. You know what, you don't know, you don't so much see the wind as much as you see the effect of the wind, The, the breeze upon your skin the wind blowing, the the leaves moving in the wind. That's the way the spirit is. There's a feeling of effect. There's a feeling of connection that is very real, and you and I can develop that. What's in truth look like? In truth includes a spiritual sense of the object worshipped and a spiritual communion with it, the manifestation of the moral conscience and feelings, motion of will, mood of elevation, and excitements. And so what that means for you and me is that in truth, we have a sense of connection with who we're worshiping. And who we worship is the Lord Jesus Christ, the Father and the Holy Spirit. We lift them up. That's who the angels are around the throne of heaven right now. And I've shared this with you before. As we gather here and worship, as you worship at home, or as you're walking along the Gulf, wherever you're worshiping, uh, the reality is you are joining in something that is already going on 24-7 from the beginning of eternity. You're joining the angels in the worship of Almighty God. And it's a wonderful thing. And so as you and I in truth worship the Lord, we're acknowledging that he is the Lord of the universe. And even more importantly, he's the Lord of our life. This word of God has a say in our life. It has a direction in our life. We're also acknowledging and worshiping the reality that the Holy Spirit is the power source for our life especially during this season of Pentecost. And we're to surrender to the presence and the power of the Holy Spirit to guide and lead our lives. And so that w- that's what it means to worship him in truth. We know who we're worshiping. It's not some benign force. It's not some benign good. It's not some nebulous thing that you and I can't define. It is the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit in the glory of God. That's what it means to worship him in truth. It means we have an understanding and agreement with who we are worshiping. The Father is now seeking by the ministry of his Son and the gift of the Holy Spirit, those who approach him with a deeply felt need and true affection in spirit, not in ceremony, but in truth, not in hypocritical or heartless confession. And so, in reality, what our Heavenly Father desires, get this, of all things, 
is a real relationship with you and me. Imagine that. It's the same thing that every human being wants with at least a few other people is a real relationship. One that is rooted in true connection, one that is rooted in honesty and truth with one another, a sense of clarity with each other, that there's a sense that you can trust one another and an understanding of who each other are for good and for ill. And so that's the, the reality of what worship truly is. It's about having a real connection with God that is alive and honest and real. I find it interesting that God is looking for the same thing that every human being looks for in their life. And that is a real relationship. And that's how God designed you and me. God designed us ultimately for authenticity. Now, we're getting there, we're not quite there yet, but that's the goal and that's the direction that God is leading us in. And that is what worship is. One of the most important things you will do in your life is worship the Lord God. Now, let me just say during worship, if you're busy thinking about what you're gonna have for your meal later on today, or you're busy thinking about the to-do list or those different things come to mind that you, you have to get done, um, let me just say to you, we all have moments of, of boredom and distraction in worship. Again, that's part of being a human being. Those things happen. I don't uh, say that to you to condemn you. I share that with you to let you know that's part of the human experience. But if that happens the whole time while you're at church, you might wanna consider that as an issue. <laughs> right? You might wanna think about that for a moment. You know, if you, if you go to dinner with somebody that you're close to or that you love and you guys have a connection with each other, it's a unique relationship, it's like your friendships, your close friendships that you can count on one hand, and if you're really blessed, maybe two hands. And you're in that relationship and you guys are talking and sharing with each other and sharing a meal with each other. Um, you usually have a sense of connection together. There's a sense that you're listening to one another and being with each other. And even though there may be different distractions around, even though there might be a waiter or a waitress coming in and out and getting this and that, Overall, what's happening in the moment is that you're with each other. And that's the way that it should be. That's the way those important relationships should be. And that's exactly what worship was with the Lord God Almighty. It's that connection with the Lord God. It's that intimate moment with him. It's that sharing that meal at the restaurant with somebody that you love. That's what worship with the Lord God is. And so if you really haven't experienced that in your life, if you're not sure what that looks like for you, I suggest a good place to start might be right here this morning. We're gonna have a prayer in just a little bit and pray for one another that our hearts would be more deeply rooted in worship of the Lord God in a, a sense of spirit and truth by the power of the Holy Spirit, that God would help our minds and renew them, that we would be more focused on him and not distracted that we would have a relationship with him that would be even more authentic. I'm also gonna pray for you, and I, pr I ask you to pray for me as well, that maybe through the rest of your, of your day, you might listen to some praise music or some worship music. I don't know about you, but I find that if I'm distracted or if I'm struggling with a problem, if I put on a, 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 some praise music or I listen to a praise station or some worship, it just helps to focus me on the Lord and begin to worship. Did you know that as people are worshiping and praising the God, Lord, you can join in on that? Anywhere you want. There's some great stuff on YouTube, some great worship bands on YouTube and other places where you can just see them worshiping God and you can join in on that. Go ahead. And again, while we're here during communion and we're worshiping the Lord, try to ask God for the grace to focus your attention on him and spend some time worshiping him and to bring you to a deeper level. Because God deeply desires people, that would be me and you, to worship him in spirit and in truth. In my recent article in Parish Life, entitled Parable of the Loving Father, I shared how the younger and older son were both seeking things from their dad and not dad himself. Dads, fathers, men, have you ever had that experience where you feel like the kids in your life or the uh, other people in your life are think, seeking the things that you can give them rather, you, rather than you yourself. You're like the ATM machine. 
right? Dad, I need some, some of this or I need some of that, and then they're off, and it's like, you know, there's, there's not really a desire for a relationship with you. Well, that's how these two boys were in what the story you know of as the prodigal son. And at the end of this story, the greatest thing the father could give them was the gift of himself. His love and a grand party celebrating the family coming together again. And you know what? I've been at the deathbeds of a lot of people in a lot of different places. A lot of different men and fathers. If it's a healthy family, somewhat, they're not going to be thinking about the money. They're not going to be thinking about one last thing they can get from dad or father, There's this man that's laying on the bed. They're going to be thinking about the relationships. They're going to be thinking about that fishing trip. They're going to be thinking about going for that walk. They're going to be thinking about how the father had shared a word of life into their life and that they'll treasure for the rest of their life. You see, that's what the heart of relationship is all about. It's about connection. It's about love. It's about being rooted together. It's about the father inviting the two sons, who are really both prodigals in different ways, into the heart of the loving father, into the sense of a family, into the sense of connection, and into the sense of this is what life, my boys, is really all about. It's about us. It's about relationship. It's about struggles. It's about forgiving that younger brother who blew all of his money already. <laughs> it's about being the older son and actually acting like the older son and coming in and welcoming back the younger brother, even though you can't stand him right now, in order that you might truly become a family. It's about love. It's about throwing extravagant parties. It's about celebrating and eating and enjoying and manja life together. That's why you and I resonate when we talk about these things and we see those things and we experience those things because we have been created for that. We've been created for that. So, wind, wind, blow on me. Wind, wind, set me free. Wind, wind, my Father sent the blessed Holy Spirit.